Okay, Niamh, we should be good now. Great. All right, Kathleen. Good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Kathleen Alice Cleary. I'm the chairperson <clears throat> of Kamora Nanoga. And on my own behalf and behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome you all here this evening. Um, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers here tonight, and we're looking forward to a very informative evening. So thank you very much. You're all very welcome. Thank you. Gurmila Mila Mahabud, Kathleen. De Yiv Accorda is Tasulagum, Gumunik, Shiftanov, Asaniha. Good evening, everyone. My name is Neve Hassett. Um, I run the Kamora and Ogluck Facebook page, and I'm honoured to be here to facilitate the commemoration this evening to remember seven Tiberi lives tragically cut short in the fight for independence. Our oration tonight is uh, given by Robert O'Keefe. Robert lives in Mantle Hill Golden. He's a keen historian and he studied English and history in UL, where he was tutored by Stephen Ryan, another of our speakers tonight. Um, he is related to the O'Keefe of Glenock, a prominent Tiberi Republican family whose house served as a meeting place and safe house for volunteers. His grandfather was a member of Dinny Lacey's Flying Column and a member of the local ASU. So Robert, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Niamh. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by saying thank you to the Committee of Camor and Anoglach for the huge honour they've given me tonight. I'm humbled and delighted to be asked to give the oration for this event remembering those brave men who gave their lives for the love of Ireland. I'm particularly pleased to see so many of the relations of uh, those seven men involved in Thank you. Hi, Robert. I think we might have lost Robert. <laughs> We're having a few technical glitches tonight, but that's okay. He'll be back on and we'll continue. Um, so what we might do now is uh, just start with um, the first part of our panel discussion this evening. Um, we have um, with us tonight uh, John Lee, who's a relative of uh, Tommy Lee, who was the first uh, volunteer who was killed this week that we're, we're remembering tonight. Um, John, hello, how are you? Um, John is a... Um, Sorry, um, John, John is, uh, as I said, a nephew of, of Tommy Lee. Um, and he, um, I've, I just need to get my notes, I'm sorry. Um, he is a graduate of both UCC mm. and Trinity College Dublin and worked in the building industry. Um, he's very happily retired and indulges his passion for wildlife and photography. Um, he is, his father was, uh, Joe was Tommy's younger brother and he was only eight years old at the time Tommy was killed um, so he had little or no memory of the actual happenings but John has written um, an article on Tommy Lee for Feathered Historical Journal and he's here tonight to talk um, about those events. We also have Stephen Ryan with us who um, has lectured in Irish history in both University of Limerick and Mary uh, Immaculate College and um, he received his PhD in 2017. Um, Stephen's research interests encompass Ireland during the revolutionary period, uh, the US trade unionism and international communism. And also on our panel, we have Paddy Lochnan, who's a highly respected local Thurlis historian and published author. His book, In Honour of Our Ancestors, is a historical chronology of the Lochnan family of Thurlis and also deals with the famine and the war of independence in the Thurlis area. He's a passionate storyteller and has been finally convinced by his wife to start writing down his, uh, these stories for posterity. So I'm going to start with Paddy. Um, Paddy, um, you're going to talk to us tonight um, about the, the night of the 9th and 10th of March in Thurlis. Can you describe the events of that night to us, please? Is Paddy there? I, I think we've lost Paddy as well. We're, we're, we're blighted tonight. Um, it's almost as bad a week as, as they had uh, 100 years ago. Um, we'll go to Stephen. Um, Stephen's going to talk to us um, about the, the brigade situation across the three brigades. Um, 
Stephen, can you talk to us about the tactics that the IRA integrary um, adopted in 1921 um, from, from January until the truce? And what was the impetus for the change in tactics? Nope. <laughs> we're, we're stuck with that. We've, we've, we've lost a few people. So um, I'll, I'll need to check that everybody's here. Um, but um, maybe Robert will... Robert, are you there now? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm back again, ah, if you can back, hear me. Robert. Wonderful. We might have time okay, to yeah, iron out our technical glitches. We'll, we'll, we'll hopefully give it a go. Um, so yeah, I had, just, I had just finished by saying there uh, that I was particularly pleased to see so many relations of those men involved in tonight's event. So we're, we're gathering tonight to remember Thomas Lee killed and feathered, Martin Clancy, Richard Fleming and Patrick Hackett killed at Knockrow and Drangan, Patrick uh, Hogan uh, killed in Derry Clooney and Lawrence Hickey and William Lochnan killed in Thurlis. So we have a very able panel of speakers uh, who will give detail tonight on their, auto on their biographies and they'll fill in a little bit on the tapestry of their lives. However, I'd like to concentrate tonight on why we remember these men and indeed why we remember all the men and women who engaged in resistance during this period. Uh, when I was in contact during the week with Neve Hassett, we were discussing the role of honour for the 3rd Tipperary Brigade. That's the, the list of those who paid the ultimate price to establish Ireland as a free and sovereign nation. And I suppose by its nature, a role of honour is a remembrance of death and a recording of the circumstances that led to the ending of lives. It's important though that we remember that there's so much more to these young lives. These men were sons, brothers, fathers, comrades, valued members of extended families and communities. Their lives amounted to so much more than the circumstances of their death. When we gather like this, we should take the time to remember their lives and their accomplishments. And we should recognize their contribution to the greater fabric of Ireland, while we're also paying honor to their sacrifice. The men that were gathered to celebrate tonight, they were all young men. The oldest, I think, was 41. Uh, at 43, that's now very young to me. Uh, they were men of varying degrees of education and training. They worked as farm laborers, draper's assistants, publicans, and a grocer's clerk. So what would have led these men, and indeed men like them, to take up arms against the British Empire or to agitate politically for independence? Well, to look at this, you have to view the changes that were taking place in Irish society over the previous decade. There was a concerted <laughs> effort to rescue the image of Ireland as being merely an adjunct to Britain. Too often, the only representations of Ireland available to the world were as comic characters on stage or in books, or as grotesque figures in the pages of Punch magazine. In opposition to this, a groundswell movement grew up that saw our unique nature recognized and celebrated. There was a flowering of Irish literature, of Irish art and drama, and it sought to rescue portrayals of Irishness from the music called caricatures. Um, in sporting terms, we saw the setting up of the GAA with clubs formed in every parish. Classes sprang up across the countryside teaching the Irish language. In towns and villages across the country, young men and women attended Feshina and Eriots. The volunteer movement, the IRB, Sinn Féin, and movements like in Guinea, the Naheran and Common Naman channeled this newfound sense of Irishness and a desire for separation, and they focused it towards political and militaristic avenues. So my point here is that these men, while they may have had little formal education in relation to what we would consider in modern times, they were exposed to a number of influences that would have allowed them to cultivate their own sense of Irishness and to develop their own belief that Ireland should be in charge of its own destiny. It's reductive to view them as merely being swept away on a tide of enthusiasm, or as many revisionist historians and broadcasters would like us to believe that they had been somehow manipulated. These young men had the capacity and the willingness to commit to a dream, to devote themselves for several years to this dream, 
and to follow their cause until the very end to deliver on this dream. Ireland owes these men a serious debt of gratitude. The question is often asked, what would they think of Ireland today? It's a question I dislike, and I think one that is perhaps unfair to the dead. They have played their part, and we now must play our part in building upon their dream. And I include all those that were involved uh, in the War of Independence here. The women who joined Come in the Mon and moved weapons and messages. Those women who sheltered, fed, and dressed the men on the run. The teenagers who acted as scouts and runners. The volunteers who did the less glamorous duties of scouting, tree felling, uh, road blocking. As well as all those volunteers who took part in ambushes, attacks, or intelligence work. In short, for Irish independence to be advanced and achieved, it was necessary for the, co the whole community to be involved. So that brings me back to my earlier question. Why do we commemorate these people? And what can we do to repay our debt to them? Well, as to the why, I believe that that generation were a golden generation. They gave everything they had to the pursuit of freedom over the four glorious years. For many of them, their only reward would be ill health, immigration, or poverty. We would be doing them a great disservice were we to forget them. The true value of events like tonight, and indeed other commemorations, is that they preserve not only the memory of these men, but they preserve the memory of a whole community that banded together. We have people online tonight from across the world, remnants of the families involved, including those who scattered from some wild island flown. All of us are here united together in paying honor to those who went before us. We have a role to play in preserving and recording the histories of that era, keeping family histories alive, keeping faces and stories from that period alive in memory for future generations. When we gather like this as communities to remember their lives, it's incumbent on us to take, a, to take a lead from their example and think, what can we do to make our community, our parishes, our country a better place? While our country is not perfect by any means, it is our country. And it's thanks to those who struggled that we all have our say in how it's run. And we all have a duty to help it improve and to build on those Republican ideals. I'll finish with some lines from a poem shared to the Camorra Facebook page by George Plant during the week. And I think it neatly encapsulates the sacrifice made by the seven men we get celebrate tonight. It's also a timely reminder that 100 years later in Tipperary, we still have Clancy's, we still have Lees and Hogan's and Fleming's and Hackett's. But 100 years in Tipperary, we no longer have British soldiers or agents of the crown. When lads like these can give their lives, the cause is safe and sure. It is not to those who inflict the most, but those who can endure. Thank you very much. Mila Buikas, Robert, that was a really lovely and thought-provoking oration. Mahu. Um, next tonight, we have a very special musical tribute to those seven volunteers shot between the 4th and the 10th of March 1921. The video was put together by our very talented committee member, Emily Nakana, and it's set to a beautiful song sung by Jerry O'Brien. Um, Jerry is a renowned singer hailing from Nina. His grandfather, Joe Liffey, was in the North Tipperary Brigade Flying Column, taking part in several operations, most notably the Modrini ambush. Jerry's grandmother, Margaret Morkins, uh, Liffey served time in Limerick Prison for her coming the Mon activities. Now, I'm not sure that Jerry is here tonight. I'll, I'll take a punt that he's not, given the last run of luck we've had. So um, we will, we'll just go ahead and share this. Um, this, it's a very poignant tribute, um, and it is the Volfinian men. So just bear with me while I share. Twas down by the Dillon side, I met a Young nettles were 
I saw the moon beaming on brave manly forms, their eyes they were gleaming. I see them again, tis all in my dreaming. Glorio. Some died with a stranger, and wise men have said that their cause was a failure. They died for all Ireland, they never saw danger. Glory. on my way thanking God that I'd met her be life along her shore I ne'er will forget her there may have been brave men but they'll never be better Gloria That was, I think everybody will agree, a very poignant tribute. So we're going to move on to the panel discussion, take two. Um, we have, we definitely have John Lee here. Um, and I think we, we have Stephen Ryan. Um, yeah, I'm here. Wonderful. And I'm not sure, but do we have Paddy? No, we'll try and come back to Paddy later. Um, so for this, then we might, um, We'll just go ahead with with um, with, with uh, these guys now. Um, so um, we already did the um, the introductions. John Lee um, is a relative of um, Tommy Lee, and Stephen uh, is is Stephen Ryan Lacken uh, from North Tipperary. So um, John, I'm going to start with you. Tommy Lee was the first of the the deaths that we're commemorating tonight. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about Tommy and how he met his death on the 4th of March? I can. Neve, thank you very much uh, and hello to everyone. Um, I can. I was actually up at the uh, monument, the spot where he was killed yesterday. Yesterday was the 100th anniversary of his death. He was actually shot on the 4th um, of March and died on the 5th. And um, we had the usual very, not the usual, we had a very modest um, commemoration for him, the flag and so on. Anyway, Tommy, if I could talk to you more generally about Tommy and maybe his family in particular, uh, because I know that many of these stories are very similar. Um, so just perhaps to widen it out a little bit for, for all of you. Um, as I say, yesterday was the 100th anniversary of his death. He died from bullet wounds inflicted um, while trying to escape. Uh, he was 20 years old 
and he was a member of the B Company, 1st Battalion of the 3rd Tipperary Brigade. Uh, he was shot in the townland of Monroe, which is just, I suppose, northeast of Feathert, and uh, about 500 yards from his own home, which was in a place called Brodeen. So as, as the crow flies, they literally are side by side. Now, unfortunately, his mother heard the shots and subsequently discovered that they were the shots that, that killed her son. Now, Tommy was born on that farm in Brodeen. He was the fourth child of William and Mary Betts. The family eventually would grow to a kind of typical post family size of 13. Um, Tommy's young life was really much the same as everyone else's. He went to school and Feathered was quite a good student, apparently. Uh, when he left school at 14 or 15, we're not sure about this, um, he seems to have gone to work. And certainly when he died, he was working as a grocer's assistant uh, in the town of Feathered on Main Street in Feathered in a shop uh, called Scully's. So that really, we're, we're certain about that. Now, what, and maybe this is something we can discuss later on, but certainly Tommy's uncles, grand uncles, great grand uncles, and in fact, two generations before the famine had gone to America and his father's uncles had gone to America. One of his grand uncles, in fact, served um, on the Union side with, um, uh, during the American Civil War. He, um, he was a wagon driver. And uh, for that, he got citizenship. And he subsequently then, as the territories were opening up in the States, um, he, to use the American expression, he, he homesteaded uh, a farm in Wisconsin. He got 160 acres. Now, what that means in, in American terms is that for a minimum of five years, you, could, you got a farm. Uh, you didn't pay anything for it. You actually worked it. And that was that. Now, that was the guy that he was also called Tom Lee, ironically enough. Now, Tom um, had quite a number of children. And again, he had his own difficulties in life. Interestingly enough, that photograph was taken very shortly after, I hope all of you can see it, was taken very shortly after he was um, demobbed from the American army. He was demobbed in Kentucky in 1865. That was taken about 1870. And very recently when I was having a look through all of this, uh, I contacted by absolute fluke the studio in Berlin and Wisconsin where this photograph was taken to see were there any remnants of that studio or the family who took the thing still going? And of course it is. So the, it was a place called the Walscott Studio. And what they immediately sent me back was a photograph of the man who took that photograph, which I'm interested in photography, so I found this absolutely extraordinary. So this guy here was running that studio from about 1855 or something until about 1900 apparently. And photography was big in America at the time anyway, especially during the Civil War, when photographers literally followed the, the, um, the battles around the place. And you could have your photographs taken in the morning and shot in the afternoon. It was all, it was all very, very convenient. Anyway, um, Tommy, that particular uncle, worked on that farm. He also had two, uh, he also had two other grand uncles. That is, Tommy had two other grand uncles in America, one called Pierce and one called uh, James. And what's interesting to me is that my immediate ancestor, William, who would be Tommy's grandfather, he was continuously writing to them, telling them how things were in the country here and asking for support to pay the rent and so on. And that support seemed to have come continuously. Uh, small amounts of money now, maybe $5 or whatever, but we're very fortunate in that we literally have the communication between the families because what was happening was that my great grandfather would write, or great great grandfather would write, the letter would start with one of his brothers in America, would be redirected to the next brother and to the next brother, and they eventually found their way to um, a first cousin, uh, a daughter of one of them, who kept all of the letters. So we have them. Anyway, the family, having got their 
funds, they survived eviction, which was very close to Bangor at one point. But then as time went on, they began to accumulate a little bit of land. And all this is relevant to Tommy as things turned out. They accumulate a little bit of land um, and eventually they ended up with three or four different small holdings. These are small holdings of 40, 50, 60 acres, that kind of thing. And what's uh, so th the family itself had a reasonably comfortable existence. And by the time Tommy was born, he was born into a reason, he was born in 1900. He was born into a reasonably comfortable family in inverted commas now, it was frugal comfort, I suppose. But as he grew up and went to school and so on, and more particularly when he finished school, he would naturally have gone to America to join his uncles and any grand uncles that were still left. But World War I was in progress, and that must have, must have impacted on uh, the ease with which he could go. Now, I know very little about that about the difficulty that the war caused for people traveling to America. And obviously some of you guys will know this, and I'd be interested to hear any comments you have to make about that, because the totality of my grandfather's family remained in the country. Now, given that there were so many of them in it, that's very unusual. So the war must have had some impact. In any event, Tommy now, by the time of 1916, he's 16 years old, um, he's maturing as a young man and so on. And by 1917, uh, he's decided to join the volunteers. And he joined them in a place called Downey's. Yes, he was in he, he was there. He was in school. Uh, he was in about, about 17. He's about 15 in that photograph we're looking at there. He's the top left with the brighter face. And his younger brother, Paddy, is in the bottom right-hand corner. Paddy also joined the volunteers, but a bit later because he was three or four year, years younger than Tommy. In, he, in any event, Tommy joined the volunteers in Downey's Barn, which is northeast, I think, of, of Feathert. And he joined it there with others. And he was 17 years old. And he was, from the record, he seems to have been made quartermaster. I don't know exactly what that meant in the context of him. He, maybe trying to find bits and pieces for the organization, but certainly his work with the volunteers was very typical manual work, and all those felling trees, digging trenches, the usual work, physical work that would interrupt um, the, the progress, I suppose, of, of the British Empire, the British Army, whatever. But he, he was certainly increasingly coming to the attention of uh, of authority as time went on. And certainly uh, by the end of 1920, he could no longer go home. He, he, was, um, he was on the run. He, uh, he, sorry, um, John, he spent some time down in Drangen, didn't he? Um, he did, yeah. He, 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 yeah, he was involved in, he was involved in a number of, operations and certainly he did he the the romantic interlude that he seemed to have had um certainly seemed to have happened near Drangen somewhere but I I, I really don't uh have too much detail my father was his younger brother and um he was emotional about it but knew very little about mm -hmm. it and most of what we subsequently learned about Tommy and his life and so on came from his other siblings who were the same age broadly as himself and who spoke about it, but they spoke about it in very emotional terms. In other words, fact uh, probably went out the window very, very easily. Um, that photograph that you're looking at now is the entire family having moved after Tommy's death and having moved from Brodeen, where they were farming, to a new farm in Loch Hopple. And that farm in Loch Hopple was semi derelict when they moved into it, and it they they never they could never actually bring it round. Uh, it it actually broke them in the finish, both I'd say financially and mentally and every other way. Now they had they had one uh, son who was away to be a priest, and there was that was uh, an expensive thing perhaps at the time as well. I don't know, but um, as far as Tommy was concerned, he uh, he was on the run as I say, for about mm -hmm. three months or maybe even four months before um, he was eventually uh, disturbed 
having his breakfast in a safe house just outside Feathered. The exact location of that house, we're not sure of. Certainly, I'm not sure of. I've been told so many different houses, I really don't know which one it is. But himself and a fellow called Paddy Ryan um, realized that the house was surrounded by, by RIC or Black and Tans or both or whatever. Now, as things subsequently turned out, um, they, the RIC were actually looking for uh, trying to trace goods that had been taken from the Feathered Railway Station. They weren't, in fact, looking for um, men on the run or anything like that. But unfortunately, the two men in the house uh, immediately reacted to the fact that the house was surrounded. Uh, maybe panicked, I could totally understand that, uh, mm -hmm. engaged in fire. They were uh, then directed to a window at the back of the house by somebody in the house. I think a housekeeper, and they escaped out that window. And in escaping out the window, in fact, they dropped some of the stuff they had with them as well, like a bandolier and things like that. Now, Tommy immediately separated from Paddy Ryan. They ran in two different directions. Paddy Ryan ran towards Rose Green, um, and he subsequently escaped uh, and, and ran to uh, Art Sala, which would have been the uh, commandant's or whatever uh, place. Uh, Tommy Ryan ran in the other direction. We know the only thing we know for sure is that he ran through um, a little garden belonged to a fellow called Jim Boy Danaher. And Jim Boy Danaher, who was about 22 at the time, was um, uh, digging whatever he was at. He was working in the garden anyway. And Tommy told him to run and go in. T Tommy told him to go indoors. And Tommy continued his run. The soldier who followed Tommy. Um, came into the garden as well. And Jim Boy Danaher apparently tried to delay him and interrupt him and whatever. Um, and for his pains, of course, he got the butt of the gun. But um, the soldier, or a soldier, subsequently got up uh, on, a, on the ditch and uh, Tommy was shot and he was shot twice. Um, now, um, he was then, uh, a horse and cart was commandeered from some farmer that was passing and Tommy was um, brought to Feathered Military Barracks. Now, they refer to it as the military hospital, but it's, it's, it was actually a barracks. En route, um, and there are contemporary accounts of this, there was a, he was suffering greatly. He had been very severely wounded. And um, he was given the last rites outside the Catholic Church in Feathered and uh, brought on his, his journey to the, to the uh, barracks. Now, in our family, it was always believed that um, medical assistance was denied. And certainly his, his sister Alice, who was his older sister, and somebody that I met in the 1960s, she was adamant that he had no proper medical assistance and that he was in fact allowed to die. Now, we subsequently know from the, from the military inquest uh, that and from the evidence of the doctor, a fellow called Paddy Stokes, that in fact, that was not the case. Um, he, um, Paddy Stokes had been called at about one o'clock in the day and medical attention was in fact rendered, but um, the wounds were such as not to be, they, were, they really were fatal. They couldn't, he couldn't deal with it. And when I got the medical report, such as it is, uh, Quite recently, I sent it to one of my relatives and I have a son who's a, a trauma person. I sent it to him and he said, you, we couldn't save him today. Not even today. The wounds were just too dramatic, you know. But his sister Alice, who was caught up in the emotion of trying to do whatever, um, she, that's what she, she firmly believed. And it's it, that's the story that came down through our... Now, um, he, he, of course, there was a huge outpouring of grief in the town after his death, and he was buried in the family cemetery, which is in, in a place called Barry, Valley Clarehan. It's the old family cemetery. As I said earlier, his mother heard the shots that, that subsequently ended his life, and uh, she was deeply distressed, obviously, by that. Not alone that but she was already heavily pregnant. And within three weeks of Tommy's death, she gave birth to her 13th child, and um, which 
I, I just can't imagine the grief. I just can't. But anyway, um, after the after the the birth, she continued to be distressed about living in Brodeen, and she insisted on moving. And the family subsequently moved from one farm to another farm four miles away. That farm was in a highly derelict state. They paid a lot of money for it. They moved very quickly and their finances went from comfort to misery within a couple of years. Moreover, the father was deeply affected by the death of his son as well. And obviously the mother and all the siblings. So uh, it, it did plunge the family into severe um, financial difficulty. And indeed, after the death of both of my grandparents, they, they, they both died intestate. The farm went into dispute. The farm was subsequently uh, so indebted that was taken over by the courts of chancery. And my father ended up buying it back. Uh, and um, we're still uh, on that farm today. And it's, it's a little bit better than it used to be, that's all. So uh, Neve, that is a very potted version uh, and I hope, uh, just to put his life in context, we as a family have, are incredibly proud of the fact of the sacrifice and moved and so on. But um, just in a family context, he lost his life. And that was a dreadful outcome. But the family also lost all, whatever standing they had financially, that was gone too. So I would imagine that each and every one of the seven soldiers who died the story behind them is probably equally disastrous. Because when you lose something like a young, vibrant man with all the hope in the world, gone. So that's my story. And um, Neve, I think I've gone on long enough. You told me five, six, seven minutes. <laughs> so we're, we're overdue. John, so, we'd, li we'd listen to you all night. <laughs> so thank you for your patience. Well, thank you very much, John. It's very interesting to hear yeah. the impact at a very personal level. Yeah. Um, you know, we kind of, I think as historians, we just tend to look at the story, but we for, we forget, it's easy to forget at a, at a hundred years um, distance, the, the actual real human cost yes. that's involved here. Yes. Every single one of those lives, for everyone, there's a whole family um, and a community who's affected by it. So thank you for that. Not at all. Um, so Stephen, uh, you weren't here when I did your introduction, so I might do it again, sure. Mm -hmm. um, so we're we're going to North Tipperary with Dr. Stephen Ryan. He's lectured in Irish history in both University of Limerick and Mary Immaculate College. Um, he received his PhD in 2017, and his research interests um, encompass Ireland during the revolutionary period, US trade unionism, and international communism. So welcome, Stephen. Um, Stephen... You. Can you discuss um, the tactics of the IRA in Tipperary in 1921? Um, so for just that six months before the truce, and if there were changes, why were the changes there? Yeah, um, of course. And I suppose just, I will try and keep it uh, somewhat brief, but um, I suppose I, I sort of gloss over some of the details that I'm just using them, I suppose, to, f to, to support the, the to support discussing the tactics. Um, but the reason why I suppose there was a general change um, in, in 1921 very much came from the viciousness of the war in the final months of 1920. And this framed the tactics and methods um, for, of the IRA in that year. The hanging of Kevin Barry on November the 1st had uh, huge military implications um, on Toglock. Uh, the 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 newsletter uh, seeking to capitalise on the execution. They hoped that uh, the martyrdom of Barry would provide a fresh inspiration and a fresh incentive to relentless warfare against the enemy murders. Um, ten days later, at a speech given by given at the Lord Mayor's banquet in London, Lloyd George stated, "By the steps we have taken, we have." murder by the throat these men who indulge in these murders say it is war if it is war they at any rate cannot complain if we apply some of the rules of war and um you can see in those 
th- those sentiments both from Untoglock and from Lloyd George that uh, it, it, it was a, a period of escalation. In August, the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act was passed, and incidentally, it was Barry who was the first person to be tried for murder by court martial under this act. And on the 10th of December, in reaction to growing lawlessness, the counties of Cork, Kerry, Limerick and Tipperary were placed under martial law, and the following month, Clare and Waterford would follow suit. Um, Of course, the introduction of the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries, uh, which began in March 1920, coupled with this act, uh, this all came together in full effect by the end of the year 1920. Uh, The tactics of the IRA during this period uh, were in many respects a reaction. They were a reaction to uh, this escalation in, in the war. The establishment of the flying columns began uh, somewhat spontaneously in the spring of 1920. It originated re- very much from, I suppose, people being on the run. And it's, it's a costly endeavor to have men on the run. It's a costly endeavor to have um, t- to feed them. And, and just from a, a security point of view, it's costly to have, have men uh that are sort of lolling about without actually uh engaging in the war so this was very much efforts on a local level initially to try and mobilize these men and get the most out of them um during this period um so it began spontaneously the forming of flying columns by brigades as a policy from general headquarters then became an official strategy in october 1920 and the flying columns were greater in size and had greater freedom to act. It also meant that the men in the run were being properly utilized. While all the brigades were ordered to set up flying columns, this didn't happen in many areas that had been um, that had not been particularly active. So, uh, so you saw it happening more so in Tipperary than in 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 other areas, even though it was a general uh, a general order in Tipperary. Um, as soon as the order came, the 3rd and 4th battalions in the western parts of South Tipperary established a joint column. Other flying columns were soon organized around the county. In North Tipperary, um, the brigade column, which uh, managed to stage some successful ambushes, which alarmed the police. Of course, there was a change in North Tipperary of the leadership, and this was very important because a lot of the older leadership that had uh, that had been in existence uh, were somewhat reluctant for different reasons. One of the reasons given was um, business interests within uh, with within the the brigade officers, um, but but this was to, was to change uh, towards the end of 1920 and into 21. So the war was to become something of a tit for tat exchange. Uh, on the 2nd of November 1920, an RIC constable named McCarthy was shot outside Nina Post Office. Now, the constable wasn't killed, but uh, reprisals were nonetheless felt as the RIC burned the houses of Jim Nolan and John Flannery on Pierce Street in Nina. Uh, Lieutenant Hamilton threatened then to shoot one of the local curates, Father O'Halloran, uh, Father O'Halloran who was outspoken against British rule. Um, and Ned O'Leary of the Active Service Unit, the Active Service Unit was, at a certain point, it became interchangeable with the Flying Columns. They sort of predated the Flying Columns, and and uh, eventually they sort of just became the same same thing. Um, returned, served by shooting Hambleton dead. Uh, once again, this was met with retaliation. Despite efforts by the battalion to defend it, the creamery in Nina was burnt uh, down by a combined force of police and military. And after the shooting in Nina, widespread raids took place. While wanted men were rarely caught, volunteer Dennis Carey was taken from his bed at the home of the McCurtain brothers in Nina and executed. IRA reaction resulted in the abortive assault and military lorry at Latera, and nine days before Christmas in 1920, four members of the RIC patrol were killed and three wounded at Kilcommon. While North Tipperary had seen an active period under the flying columns, the second column then, um, which was set up in March under Sean Hogan, failed to mount any successful ambush. So it wasn't that, that flying columns generally brought in 
a, a sort of uh, this wave of activity it was just certain flying columns were particularly active during this period. As the spring of 1921 arrived, however, countermeasures of the military, um, as well as longer evenings, which is, of course, a very um, practical uh, hurdle to face for military activity, uh, contributed to the diminishing successes of the flying columns. The flying columns were no longer an effective enough force, and General Headquarters in April 1921 um, sought to initiate IRA uh, divisions, and the newly appointed division commandant disbanded two of the three columns in the South Tipperary Brigade. The success of the flying columns was hindered by both uh, the lack of mines and military intelligence. Uh, the measures of their success, however, was that the Tipperary police were unable to perform their tasks in the countryside as the continued presence of armed volunteers prevented their movement. And I think it's very important to recognize what exactly the goal was. And the goal was far to make Tipperary, to make each respective um, division uh, unsustainable for, for both policing and military. Um, for non column rank and file, volunteers fighting was somewhat rarer. In an attempt to avoid complacency, each battalion received an action program for the third week in January. So this is just an, uh, an example of, I suppose, there had been a growing complacency within non um, column rank and file. So they, they, there was a distinct effort to try and mobilize and utilize um, these men, each uh, so each battalion, um, they received this action program. During this week, all enemy posts were to be sniped at at least once a night and as often as possible during the day. All enemy proclamations were to be torn down and it was encouraged for wires to be uh, caught and the most victorious, or sorry, the most vic vicious of RIC and black and tans were to be shot on sight. An ambush on patrol or lorry was to take place once during the week and all main roads were to be destroyed at two points at least. And I suppose a lot of a lot of the actual um, as 20, 1921 went on, a lot of of activity stemmed less from an organized tactical um, drive, but more so individual efforts and um and efforts of of distinct uh groups and regions uh to try and mobilize and i'm just thinking again it was very much motivated by that tit for tat some somebody did something to me i will return and i'm just thinking within my own uh within my own family going back um there recently they celebrated the 100 year or <laughs> celebrated that's the wrong word to use they uh i suppose remembered the 100 years since uh the family home was burned down um in uh and in in after that had happened uh the father of the family the father of uh Paddy Ryan Lacken and and Martin Ryan Lacken, Matt Lacken, he had been held frequently in the Bridewell uh, in Newport and he would have been taken out on the front of lorries uh, to prevent the lorries being shot at. So um, in retaliation for this, there was uh, the execution of the district inspector in the region and alongside him, um, uh, tragically, I suppose, um, uh, Lady Barrington was also shot. Um, it was tragic in the sense that, um, in the sense that it was an unnecessary death. It wasn't somebody. She wasn't somebody who was who was a target. Um, but uh, but she had been wearing. Um, I think it was uh, riding clothes or something like that. That that uh, made it hard to discern who or what. She was uh, coming in the car at the time of the ambush, and also, um, and also, I suppose, uh, like on Toglock, I don't know how how much credence I can give it as a as a sort of a source on it, but they they described it as hiding behind uh, hiding behind a lady's skirt, and that this was an effort to prevent um, to prevent shooting at at the police was to 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 use a 
to use a woman as a shield. Um, so I suppose there was there was there was a tragic element to it, but um, given the circumstances, uh, I suppose it, 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 while while it might have been avoided had more knowledge been uh, been had at the time, it, it wasn't. So I suppose just to sum the whole thing up, um, the fl- while the flying columns very much brought forward and the, the change in leadership brought forward in North Tipperary the uh, the amount of activity of the IRA during that period. Also, the IRA uh, with, the, with the flying columns ceased to be effective and was moving towards more divisional uh, leadership uh, and also individualistic efforts and tit-for-tat warfare was just the reality of the period. Yeah, a brutal time. I suppose these, these tactics were really... Um being formed in Ireland, weren't they? They weren't, uh, you know, th- nobody had a game plan on this. They were making it up as they went along. They were making it up as they went along. I suppose a lot of, like, it's interesting to see the the opposing perspectives um, that, 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 that come up when, when analysing it. Uh, General headquarters were very much looking for, um, for distinct organisation, while uh, on the actual ground, there wasn't necessarily the facility there mm-hmm. for to do so. Like we talked there about um, not having enough mines to carry out attacks. The you know, and this this led to frustration on the ground, and in many respects, a sort of a a shirking off a, a desire to maybe shirk off the the bureaucracy aspect of. Um, of the warfare at the time, because there was a sense of creeping bureaucracy, a sense that uh, there was a sort of a uh, a hidden alien le- leadership in Dublin that that were weren't necessarily au fait with what was happening on the ground, um, and also this was happening at at a smaller level within uh, within battalions. And within in brigades, I mean, and this came to to light with um, problems of um, crossing between different brigade areas, um, and also uh, again going back to an ambush that took place um, with with Sean Gaynor. He he was. I think they were thirty minutes away from victory, and they got the order to uh, to to retreat. Uh, they ended up retreating, and there was a general frustration. So I suppose there was a lot of conflict uh, mm-hmm. between between um, the leadership and and the actual um, how how things happened on the ground. Um, there wasn't there wasn't to go back to what you said there wasn't a manual for it and interestingly um i remember reading uh an interview that was conducted with john joe rice in, in kerry uh a commander in kerry and it was conducted um in the 1960s and the lady came from america to interview him and she noticed that he was reading uh he was reading the works of che guevara and he was drawing comparatives between the War of Independence in Ireland, and he felt that that surely they had an impact on what would happen in Cuba many, many years later. So I suppose while they didn't have a manual, they were very much providing a manual for for later struggles in other places, other countries. Very good. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was really, really interesting. Um, now, we do have Paddy Lochnan with us um, from Thurlis, um, but Paddy doesn't have any video. But I can assure you that Paddy is entertaining enough that he doesn't need any video. So, um, hello, Paddy, are you there? No, I'm gone again. <laughs> ah, you're I'm here, what? Paddy. Look at you. And you have a beautiful profile picture of, of Liberty Square. Uh, yeah, and the beautiful uh, 98 <laughs> monument. So, yeah, the 798. Yeah, that's where just across from where Lawrence Hickey was shot. Yeah. Now I'm just I'm just looking for the gentleman who told me to log out. I have a sledgehammer waiting for him. 
<laughs> Could you name the gentleman? I don't know what he's joking. How are you keeping on? Yeah, sorry about that. They seem to be taking. Then you were packed to capacity and Zoom wouldn't let me in. It's it's a good um it's a good complaint that we have we're at capacity tonight. Yeah. But um Paddy, look, can you um can you talk to us about um Thurlis on the night of the 9th and 10th of March, please, 1921. Um, can you describe for us what happened that night? Yeah, on the 9th of the 9th of March, we start with the 9th because it becomes a bit kind of a what would I put discrepancies over both days. On the 9th of March, 1921, in Quarry Street, now known as Mitchell Street, my granduncle William Lucknan, uh house was attacked. Uh, can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Right. Yeah, what happened is there was a, there was a hit list that was compiled by the RIC, the Black and Hands, and some auxiliaries, and it was uh, given out to them to go and assassinate certain people with whose names were on the list, would be Republicans and Sinn Feiners on the list. And on the night of the night, uh, up on the Quarry Street, uh, the family were inside, and it was early, and the family were inside, and uh, the RIC then, the murder squad, came up along the road, and they were looking at windows here because three Lockdown families lived on the same street, within a few doors of each other. And if they got the wrong family, then the element of surprise would have been lost. So uh, there was a kind of an informer. There was an informer there then who, what do you call it, who had scribed uh, the initial WBL on the windowsill of the Lachnan household, which stands for William Burke Lachnan, because his mother's name, maiden name was Burke. And on that night, uh, the assassins went to the wrong house first with my grandfather, two doors up, Willie's brother, and banged on the door. But my grandmother refused to let him in. She just said, everybody stay quiet, pretend we're not here, whatever. So uh, the, one of the assassins then called and said he found the actual house. And they banged on the door. And Willie's father, Patrick Lachnan, answered the door. And he thought it was going to be not a normal raid because they raided on a number of occasions. So what happened that night then was uh, when he answered the door, the assassins uh, grabbed him and shoved him down the hallway into the kitchen at the back of the house. Now, Willie was upstairs in the bedroom with his brother James, both sleeping early, got the up for work early next morning. Uh, two uh, guards, two assassins held the family in the back kitchen of the house. Two went upstairs, three actually went upstairs, sorry, and two sat outside. And uh, when they ascertained who Willie was, they went to shoot him. But Willie's older brother, James, who was in the room, jumped on top of uh, Willie and said, take my life, he said to my younger brother. But the two assassins caught him and held him down by the hair and knelt on him. And then they shot four bullets, or shot a number of bullets, but four entered Willie's body, two to the heart, one to the temple and one to the neck. He lived for a while afterwards. Now, some people say a few hours, but he only lived an hour and a bit. And uh, he died then of his injuries. Uh, his mother then went to the window and she shouted, come back, ye murdering bees. Uh, and they turned around and they fired at her. Now, the bullet holes would be still in the wall outside. It's only for her husband who grabbed her and pulled her back in that she would have been injured on the night or even dead. So uh, Willie lasted. And uh, from Willie's sister then, Mal, and another brother who was, me, that's my grandfather next door, went down to get a priest. The tan stopped him down at the bridge. And they told him to get back. They refused to let him off. But Willie's sister was very prominent, very strong with woman and a member of the coming of Mon. And she persisted. She wasn't going back. So they allowed her to go and get the priest. And then when the priest came up to the house, he gave the last right. But Willie died in his brother's arms, James, the guy who was there. And uh, poor Willie. Uh, after that, then, that Willie would have been the first house because when they entered the uh, Quarry Street to come up by Cathedral. Willie would the first house. Second house then would have been Lawrence Hickey, who lived in Liberty Square at the time, who was a publican. Now, Lawrence wasn't a member of the volunteers, but he was a Sinn Féinor, from the Sinn Féinor. And uh, they entered his house then, knocked at the door and his wife answered. And then what happened was when she answered, they pushed her into the hall. She was pregnant now. She was a few months pregnant with their child. The tragic thing about Lawrence, though, was Lawrence already married in 1916, and his first wife died in childbirth. And then when uh, they assassinated Lawrence on the night, his second wife was in childbirth, so Lawrence had a tragic ending that he didn't know 
any of his children because you know what I mean. And then the children didn't know him, the young his son Larry. They were tragic events. Uh, Lawrence then with a couple of different, uh, how would I put it, uh, stories to Lawrence at one as well as Willie, that Lawrence was shoved down the stairs by uh, Jackson and then shot down at the bottom by Henry. <laughs> now, that'd be one story. The other story is that when he was pushed down the stairs, but the neck one broke and he got up and he was making run for the back hall <laughs> and they followed him and they started shooting him there and then and they shot him and they held his wife up against the wall who was pregnant at the time. Now, I believe there were two other women in the the hall at the, in the house at the time, and they were held up outside in the backyard in their night at the, at the night dresses. Uh, young Darcy then went to get the priest for uh, Lawrence uh, give the last rites, and there was, I believe, there was a bit more of a struggle there that the door go back as well. From there, then they went out to uh, the Golflings to Dennis O'Regan. He was one of the guys that survived. Dennis was shot a number of times, but the tragedy at Dennis, but Dennis was already hidden and they, they didn't know he was there. And uh, what happened is they took uh, Barry's son, Michael Barry owned the place. They took his son and they said, we'll shoot him instead. And Dennis came out with his hiding hole, which I believe was a bed couch that you lift up and you could hide in. And he came out because he didn't want his player son to be shot. So they took him outside and they shot him a number of times and he saw an opportunity when the tans, the RAC, they hope a cigarette, and he ran towards the river, which is only about 20 yards from the house, and he escaped. So he was one the lucky one. But he had a kind of tragic life after that, poor fella, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So basically, yeah, then on the day of Willie's funeral, and Lauren Siggy's funeral, the cathedral then the, on the 11th, uh, the, how would I put it, the Black and Hands Auxiliaries and the uh, RAC, so I hope three positions. One on the shore bridge, which is the Mal Bridge, we call it, on there, and they had a machine gun uh, post face in the church. The second position was across from the church at the old Monster Hotel. They had another position of a uh, machine gun there. And the third position was up there at the roundabout, just at the giant of Mitchell Street and Kicking Street. And they had another out there. I believe, from records, I believe there was about two, three thousand at the funeral of both. Uh, to the volunteer and the Sinn Féinor. And the, the, at the time, the RAC at the time of the auxiliaries sent in word to the church that the coffins cannot come out of the church with the tricolour on them, that the tricolour had to move or to be more reprisals, and that uh, the families of the Loch Nans would have to go in cares. Now, how are we going to fit a couple of hundred mourners and we the big family at the time in the car to travel only 200 yards up to the graveyard. So it was a tragic event. And inside the church, our Bishop Harty presided over the mass. And also in there was uh, Reverend Ryan. And the crowd inside were crying blood for blood. And they were trying to calm the crowd in the church, the archbishop and the priest, because they were fed up for the retaliate, you know, the, the students and they wanted to retaliate. So basically, that's the story of that, Dave. And uh, Billy, Willie, as you know, is buried above in St. Mary's and Lawrence is buried above in killing all. God rest them both. So they're the kind of tragic events of uh, that time. Tragic, but if we, go, if we go back one week before that, we have to remember William uh, Kelly, who was shot. He was shot above at Loch de Galla, the Bowling Green. He was on scout duty and he jumped the wall to warn the bike if you come from Mass. And they asked him to stop, so the story goes. But he, he kept running to warn his comrades, and he was shot there and then unarmed in the Loch de Galla. And the tragic story about him, his body was thrown on the back of the Crosby tender, which was a truck, and drove it past his mother and father who were standing at the gate, or at the door, sorry. And uh, then they drove back up and drove back down a few times, Robert Height and the family. So another forgotten uh, volunteer of the time. Yeah. Now, they have him down on the military records of Thomas Kelly, but his right name is William Kelly. William Thomas Kelly. was a different fella. Yeah. Um, Paddy, you, you, you talked about these men ca calling to houses um, in the middle of the night and shooting people. Can you, was this the first time something like this happened? Or was, has there, was there a history of this? 
well, Willie, if I think it's big for Willie, Lawrence, you know, would be, he was, like I said, Sinn Féin, of where my granduncle Willie was a volunteer and all his family, all his brothers were involved in his father. And William was a drill instructor. If William done prison time for uh, attacking an RSE man of town, a fellow called Stephen Barrett. And he attacked him and he was brought. In fact, the hunt had a very, uh, how would I put it, a dislike for the Loch Nands back then for some reason. So did a couple of RAC lads in the town. And uh, his other brother, Pad, who was second lieutenant and trained up here as well, he done uh, six months in the Black North, which is Belfast. They called the Black North a jail up there at the time. Yeah, there was a uh, tick for tack for a long time between members of the volunteers here and the RIC, the auxiliaries in black and tans, when they came. And there was tick for tack. It was, uh, Torlitz had a lot of history that went unrecorded, you could say, and uh, it was sad to see the way it went. But thank God now everybody's been in the back for the 100th anniversary of the shooting. Yeah, the uh, Torlitz would have been very prominent uh, Sinn Féin town and uh, volunteers. Now, in 1914, they set up the volunteers here in Torlitz in a place called, um, they had the first uh, meeting above and beside the Tipperary Star at the restaurant there. And they had the first meeting there. And they come up from Club Mill and they formed the volunteer. They split it then in 1914 because of the war. Yeah. And then because the home rule, some wanted to go. And uh, a great majority joined the national volunteers and the local Irish volunteers then reformed in 1916 here in town abroad there in a place called Brady's Mill on the Mill Road, which is demolished as well to this day. Yeah, there, there would have been a lot, and you've gone back there, a lot of uh, tick for tack between all of them. Yeah, and, and the volunteer families um, within Thurlis, were they, they were a close-knit community, were they? The ward, because in Quarry Street, where William Kelly lived, the upper Quarry Street, my granduncle lived then down a bit. And at the Quarry Street would have had a lot of, uh, I say it, old jock, I say it would have had about 40 volunteers alone at that street wow. for the whole street. And that's, you know what I mean? The houses still exist there, but most of the families have passed on. There's not many families left down there. There would have been a party member. They were, would have been in the A Company here. B Company was the bar in the town over the bridge, we call it. Yeah. We were the east side of the river, they were the west side. Uh, yeah, there would have been a lot in there, Neve, at the time. And yeah. it's a, kind of sad, though, looking back. But as we all know, war is war, and you know what I mean? People suffer for both sides. But yeah, families would have been, there would have been a lot of uh, reprisal, the shops being raided, taking stuff out of the shops by the RAC and not paying for up a gun pint here in Turles. They would have done that as well. Yeah, um, it, 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 there were very troubled times indeed. Um, thank you very much, Paddy, for that. Um, that's drawn a close to our um, the first part of our panel discussion for the evening. But um, we have a little interval um, piece of entertain well a, a poignant um, poem uh, tonight. Um, so this is the Nakro Ballad, and it's going to be um, recited by Quivino Kaila. Um, so Quibine is a grandnephew of Martin Clancy, who was killed at the age of 18 in Knock Row, and um, of his brother Pat Clancy, who was killed by British forces in November in 1920 at Drangan, age 19. His brother Larry was imprisoned as a volunteer as well. Um, their sister Josie, Quibine's grandmother, was an active member of Common Naman, who had the awful task of identifying both bodies of her brothers at the young age of 16. She was a very brave woman. At Martin's funeral, his father said defiantly at the graveside to the British uh, forces after losing his second son, I have more sons. We'll not see their like again. Quivine's grandfather was also a volunteer of Tipperary's second Brig brigade, Dennis Kiley. On Quivine's mother's side, his great grandfather, Donica, Okishtalba was a native Irish speaker from County Clare, a member of Conran Aguilega, Bar on Rohar, traveling around teaching Irish, a hedge school teacher. He succeeded from uh, Thomas McDonough's father as the primary school teacher in Clock Jordan. He became good friends with Thomas McDonough, and it was himself who taught McDonough Irish, which helped him to develop his excellent literature. Uh, it's all yours, Quibine. Thank you. Your real magots, uh, Neve, um, uh, I guess it's more than Ordum on uh, Don Show, Ara, and you are an EHA special to show. So, uh, the Ballad of uh, Knock Row. Twas on the sixth day of March, that day it brought us woe. 
we lost our gallant comrades that were murdered in Knockrow. But had they all been armed, they'd boldly stand, make a stand and show those English cowards how they'd fight for motherland. O oh, brave, brave Martin Clancy, you were a hero true. Likewise, Paddy Hackett and Richard Fleming too. You are gone from us, dear comrades, to the land that knows no pain, but your names will live forever with the glories of Sinn Féin. May God protect you, our comrade Croak, who was wounded in the fray. Likewise, Walsh, a prisoner who was captured on that day. Our watchword now is vengeance for those heroes who are gone. Until the flag of freedom, we can float or the slopes of Slivnaman. Gramagov. Gramila, Mila, Mahaka, Quivin, Kahuta, Kerfa. Thanks very much, Quivin. So now we're on to uh, the second part of our discussion, and I actually think we have everybody here for this one. Um, so our speakers tonight, um, uh, we have Mark Fitzell. Uh, Mark is from Cashel. He's a well-known local author uh, who recently published a third volume of his highly successful series, The Many Faces of Cashel. Uh, these books are fascinating look at Cashel's many characters from the distant and recent past, as well as the characters of today. Mark has a keen interest in history, particularly that involving the Cashel volunteers. Um, another member tonight who's going to speak is Michael Moroni. Michael is from Drangan County, Tipperary, and he's had a, an interest in local and national history from an early age. His family on both sides were involved in the War of Independence and the Civil War, the Maloneys and Drangan and the, e the Moronis and Dragon and the Egans and Mulnahon. Um, Michael's uncle, Nicholas Moroni, was involved in planning the attack on Drangan Barracks uh, with Sean Tracy. Um, his granduncle Jim Egan was killed in the last weeks of the Civil War. Michael lives in Waterford and is a member of the 3rd Tiberi Brigade Old IRA Commemoration Committee as well as Camorra Nanoglock. Dan Jack is joining us as well. Dan is our only non tiberi um, participant tonight. Uh, he hails all the way from Clonard, uh, the Clonard area of West Belfast. Um, he has a deep-seated family connection to the district, including a relationship through his maternal lineage to 3rd Tipperary Brigade OC Seamus Robinson, who came originally from the area. Daniel possesses a keen interest in local and national history with a particular emphasis on the development of Irish republicanism in the early 20th century. He's a founder member of Oros e Conila, an interpretive centre located on the Falls Road and dedicated to James Connolly. He's published two highly acclaimed books, Citizen Soldier, a, bi a biography of Seamus Robinson and the most magnificent searching for Sean on the life of Sean Tracy, which he co-authored with me. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, Mark, I'll start with you. Um, are you there? Mark, are you on mute? I'm not going to start with Mark. So um, Michael, uh, we'll start with you. Um, Michael, can you tell us um, about what happened on the afternoon of the 6th of March um, in Drangan? Thank you, Neve. Uh, yes, on Sunday evening, the 6th of March, 1921, according to the Bureau of Military History witness statements of the battalion adjutant, Thomas O'Carroll, and the witness statement of Sean Walsh from Coolanur Feathert. There was a battalion council meeting uh, held in the stable of Boland's disused farmhouse at Knockrow on a hillside overlooking Drangan village. There had been an arms fund collection shortly beforehand uh, in the 7th battalion area, and this meeting was for the company officers to hand in the money collected. According to Thomas O'Carroll's account, the meeting was delayed waiting for the officers from one of the companies to arrive. The 12 officers who were present at the meeting were Dennis Sadler, Kenny Drangan, Vice Commandant of the 7th Battalion, Thomas O'Carroll, Battalion Adjutant, Edward Grace, A Company Drangan, Martin Clancy, A Company Drangan, Patrick Hackett, A Company Drangan, Michael Sinjan, A Company Drangan, Richard Fleming from the E Company Midlass, Morris Walsh, E Company Midlass, William Ahasy, C Company Clunin, Dennis Croke, F Company Laffins Bridge, Sean Walsh, E Company Midlass, and Joseph Farrell, B Company Ballangarry. All in all, five of the seven companies in the battalion were represented at the meeting, 
which lasted approximately an hour. As the battalion adjutant, Thomas O'Carroll was about to give the order to dismiss the meeting, some, uh, to dismiss the meeting, uh, someone remarked, look outside. Thomas O'Carroll recounted, glancing through what had once been a window, I saw the steel helmets of British troops advancing in extended order towards the old stable. There was only one exit through the doorway and that was facing the oncoming soldiers. According to Sean Walsh's account, the British soldiers were only 15 yards from the stable door when they were seen by the volunteers. They were about to take cover behind a low wall about 15 yards from the stable door. Tom O'Carroll had grown up in Drangan, a short distance from the Volan stable, and knew the area well. He knew there was a fox cover with a ravine running through it, a short distance to the rear of the stable, and felt that if they could reach that, they had a good chance of escaping. There was no time for discussion, so O'Carroll told the rest to follow him. He rushed out the door and he and six or seven others reached the cover of a low wall to the right of the stable door as they were leaving. Sean Walsh fired one shot from his automatic revolver, which briefly made the British soldiers take cover behind a stone wall in front of them. When he went to fire, when he attempted to fire a second shot, his automatic jammed and he couldn't fire. From behind the low wall to the right of the stable door, uh, Sad uh, Dennis Sadler fired a few shots at the soldiers again, which forced them to remain under cover of the stone wall in front of them for a few more seconds. Those few seconds were to prove life-saving for those who had gone to the right-hand side on leaving the stable. For they made it around the stable and then under fire from the British, they managed to reach the fox cover and the ravine uh, in the fox cover. Unfortunately, not all of those uh, gathered at the 7th Battalion Council meeting on that Sunday evening made it to safety. Drangan's Martin Clancy and Dennis Croke of Blaffins Bridge turned left when they came out the doorway. They had gone about 150 yards from the stable when they came directly under fire of the British troops. Martin Clancy fell wounded at the side of a ditch and when the soldiers came up to him, they shot him dead. Dennis Croke was wounded and captured. Patrick Hackett of Drangan was hit by a hail of Lewis gunfire about 100 yards from the stable. There were some reports that he died at the spot, but he actually survived till the early hours of Monday morning. There are conflicting accounts of how uh, Richard Fleming of Midlass died. Thomas O'Carroll's account says that he was killed by a grenade which the British soldiers flung into the stable. But Sean Walsh's account says that Dick Fleming was killed almost beside him as he left the doorway of the stable by the first or one of the first volleys fired by the British soldiers. While this was happening, Thomas O'Carroll, Dennis Sadler, Edward Grace, Michael Sinjin, William Ahasey, Sean Walsh and Joe Farrell uh, were making good their escape. Dennis Sadler went away on his own while the other six made their way across country to Clunine. The bodies of Adjutant Martin Clancy and Captain Dick Fleming and the seriously injured Pat Hackett, along with the wounded Dennis Croke and the prisoner Morris Walsh, were taken to Mullinahone RIC barracks. At about 12 o'clock on Sunday night, a party of military in motor lorries, accompanied by a Red Cross ambulance, left Kilkenny military barracks for Mullinahone. Dennis Croke and Patrick Hackett were conveyed to Kilkenny military barracks in the early hours of Monday morning, and Pat Hackett succumbed to his injuries shortly after admission. The British Occupation Army in Ireland had taken the lives of three more young Irishmen. Michael, um, how do you think knowledge of that council meeting uh, came to the British forces? Well, that's that's a good question. Um, basically, uh, a report was made at the RIC barracks in Mullinahone on Sunday morning that um, this meeting was to take place. I don't know who made the report, but um, as we all know, informers have been the bane of Irish freedom through, for centuries. Um, but the IRA had friends in the RIC barracks in Mullinahone. Uh, one of the friends was Constable William Campbell, and he uh, apparently told two Mullinahone volunteers about the plans to raid this meeting in Drangan. Unfortunately, that news was never relayed to Drangan, uh, but Constable Campbell did his best to, to um, let the IRA know. Uh, so an informer basically 
And then on the other hand, we had Constable Campbell, one of the RIC men there, who was friendly to the IRA, told the um, uh, two IRA volunteers in Mullinahone that this was to happen and the information was never relayed to Drangan. Uh, and that had a tragic, Constable Campbell, tragic end two weeks later. This happened on Sunday, the 6th of March. Two weeks later, on Sunday, the 20th of March, um, the IRA surrounded Mulnahone in an effort to shoot a man who was called the Foxy Offer, Officer, um, Litchford. He was known as Litchfield at the time, but his name was actually Litchford, and he was responsible for a number of deaths in the 7th Battalion area, including Tommy Donovan in back on the 31st of October 1920, and Pat Clancy uh, on the 19th of November in Drangan. Uh, the IRA were out to get Litchford. They surrounded Mullinahone RIC barracks in an attempt to get him, and Constable Campbell, who was not on duty, but was still in uniform, heard noise and came out into the, his backyard in Mullinahone, was mistaken for Litchford and was shot dead. Um, so the IRA had shot one of their friends in the RIC, tragically, two weeks after uh, the Nacro ambush. Oh, that's terrible. Um, so from that count, Michael, um, at this point um, in the war for independence, um, the 7th Battalion had lost five volunteers uh, in, four, in less than four months, or just over four months. Um, how many volunteers from the 7th Battalion were killed in total, and what was the impact of all this death in such a tiny community? Um, altogether, the 7th Battalion lost uh, 16, 16 men, uh, nine in the War of Independence, and either six or seven in the Civil War. Um, so a pretty high toll uh, locally. And um, I just see on the screen here that uh, Litchford, the man that they were uh, attempting to uh, attempting to shoot that day in uh, Mullinahone on the 20th of March, he actually lived to his 90s uh, and lived in, in retirement down in uh, the south of England in uh, a seaport someplace down there. But um, the toll was great for the 7th Battalion. There was... Uh, um, Six, 15 or 16 killed, um, nine in the War of Independence, six or seven in the Civil War. Um, obviously for all of their families, for their communities and for their battalion, it was devastating that they would lose that many uh, volunteers, but it wasn't the, the greatest number. That I think uh, the first battalion at Tipperary was the greatest number of uh, volunteers lost. The, um, after Nacro, tension was high around Drangan, Drangan and South Tipperary and Revenge was obviously sought, and revenge came fairly fast. Uh, the day after um, Nacro, Monday the 7th, uh, Dennis Sadler, who had escaped Nacro and made his way uh, elsewhere to a safe house, he happened to be walking with two or three other volunteers through Kilbury Estate, which had been a hugely contested estate during the Land League days. And uh, when they came upon George Lysett, who was the owner of the, state, the estate, and he was a well-known um, informer uh, to the RIC and to the British Army, uh, a friend of the occupation forces. And uh, I suppose as almost a spontaneous reaction to what had happened the day before, Dennis Sadler shot him, shot D George Lysett there in Kilbury. Uh, Lysett survived. Uh, he survived till the 20th of June, uh, tragically, Dennis Sadler died before him on the uh, 6th of June. So um, there were a number of other uh, um, uh, people who were assumed to be informers and uh, who were tried and they were killed in the locality. But yes, the tension was very high um, and there were at least two or three in the area killed as informers. Yeah. OK, it's it's the... It's the hidden side of, of this war, um, I suppose, but we can see that the human cost uh, on both sides. But, um, you know, it looks like a lot of a lot of these um, incidents that happened even just in this single week. Uh, there, there's that element of information given to Crown forces that led to the deaths of volunteers. Um, it, it's it's 
it's desperately sad. Um, and now, Dan, um, I, I think um, if you could give us some con national context on this, was what we're seeing this intensity of the war in Tipperary, was that reflected elsewhere in the country um, at a national level? Hi, Neve. Yes, um, I think it's it's important to recognise that 1921, certainly the first six months leading into the truce period, was the most intensive part of the war for independence. Um, it had, as Stephen had alluded to, it had been building from late 1920. Um, in that first six months of 1921, there was over a thousand deaths across Ireland. And in March of 1921, the period that we're talking about, there was around 214 uh, deaths that, that took place um, in, in that month. Um, I think it's also important to recognise that it, it, the violence was intensifying. Um, there had been previous attempts by uh, the British. There was overtures had come from certain sections within the, the, the British government. Um, and there's the often fabled um, hawks versus the doves. And in this instance, the, the hawks won out. Um, they had asked for preconditions around engagement with the uh, with Republicans that the IRA had to surrender arms and so forth. And people like Hammer Greenwood and uh, Neville McCready, they wanted an extension of, of martial law. Um, in effect, they wanted to crush the IRA. Um, you had the Government of Ireland Act as well, so partition was essentially happened. Um, but the British, they, they were perfecting and refining the, their, their tactics. They, they had reorganised a lot of their intelligence. Um, you can see that there, if we link that back to the death of Sean Tracy, that, that's probably a mm -hmm. di direct result of uh, the, the reorganised British intelligence efforts. Um, they were holding more targeted reprisals. So they were, um, they were going for Republicans or they were targeting households and vicinities of where ambushes had, had happened. Um, and they were also developing their, their military tactics. Again, as Stephen alluded to, to counter the IRA and, and what the IRA were doing. So the British were, were mobilising large columns um, they had created smaller, um, what they called active service platoons, which were, were small, smaller units that were sent out. Um, they began executing IRA men um, that were caught with, with arms. And there's an example there um, in Tipperary with Sean Allen, who had been executed in, in Cork in, in February. I think it's um, as well... The, the province of Munster really was the epicenter of, of guerrilla struggle at, the, at this stage. We did, uh, we did see the formation of, of the flying columns in, in late 1920. There had been an escalation of ambushes, etc. But again, equally, um, the columns themselves became targets. Um, and we see in this month as well what, what happened at, at Cross Barry. Um, although uh, on, the, on that occasion, the IRA were able to sort of break out of the encirclement. Um, but you had other incidents, again, in Cork, uh, like at Clonmult, um, where, where there was a number of, of volunteers killed. I think uh, certainly from my research and, and uh, Seamus Robinson, he, he believed that the, the this was inevitable, uh, and he actually sort of stipulated that there should be two smaller columns uh, formed to try and um, to try and counter this. Um, we also see in this period as well that the British started using aerial reconnaissances, um, so the airplanes were used to try and locate the the columns and stuff. So there was a real sort of escalation. There was an intensification of the British efforts in this uh, in this period. Yeah. Um, thanks very much. Um, Mark, I want to bring you in here now. Um, Can you hear me? On, on the day of the 6th, early in the morning, um, there was uh, a shootout near New Inn. But I want to take you back two days before that. 
can you tell us what happened in Cashel on the night of the 4th of March, please? Y yeah, can you hear me, Neve? Yeah. Can, Mark, yeah. Yeah, I suppose, Neve, you're my big interest would have came in all this and getting into research, and I suppose what went on in the War of Independence would have been my interest, I suppose, in local history. Um, I remember just doing a little search one night and finding out about uh, this shooting that took place in Cantwell's Bear. Um, it was Cantwell's up to maybe six or seven years ago. Um, it's on the main street in Cashel. I think it's called Bows and Coes now. So um, I suppose just to go back a, f a, a little bit before it, um, there was an order given out that um, at the start of March that there was a black and tan RIC auxiliary, whatever, to be shot in every every company area around Tipperary. I suppose reading up on it, one of the main main ideas behind it was to take away the heat um, from County Cork, which it was getting at the time. Um, so Paddy Hogan, the man that we're on to speak about, dead 100 years ago today, um, he took three other volunteers with him um, and they went, they stayed the night before, two of them stayed very, very close to Cantwell's Bear where um, the Black and Tans and, and, and the RIC used to drink. Um, seemingly a couple of days before a tailor's house, had the roof had been burned off a tailor's house where anybody familiar with John Street in Cashel, St. Vincent de Paul is there, it's opposite, the, it's opposite um, uh, the Protestant church in Cashel, Taylor's house had been burnt. Um, and they reckon that this guy, Besant, James Besant, um, that, that he had been instrumental in burning the roof off of it. Besant had been a, a, a World War I veteran. Um, so, so the night before it, Paddy Hogan and Bill O'Donnell um, who was kind of his right hand man? They stayed in Ed Ryan's, where Mister Mister is now in in Cashel. Um, Paddy Hogan was a draper's assistant. He worked there with Ed Ryan until I suppose he left and he went on the run. Um, you've all that lovely covered on the piece you put up today, Neve. Um, so the night of the the night of the fourth, um, the fourth of March, um, at about six. Seven o'clock. Um, they got the, the four boys got the word that um, there was two RIC men drinking in Cantwell's Bear. At the time, anyone familiar with Cantwell's um, in in our in, in our lifetime, Cantwell's is always one area. But at the time, it was split in two, so there was a kind of a shop which was was a bear, a little bit of a bear, and then it was the main bear so they got word that there was a black and tan drinking in either side of it but i suppose by the time they got together and they got down both of those had left but the guy uh, besant known locally as sunny jim had come into the bear now people who would remember besant would have remembered him as kind of dapper kind of afraid of nothing um kind of very up on local knowledge and and light drink and song and and girls uh, if, if, if you read a little bit more into him or whatever, but what happened was Hogan, um, Hogan and Bill Ud or Hogan and Tom Nagel went in. Now Tom Nagel was an ex um, British British soldier, and so was Paddy Hogan uh, or Paddy Kane, who he brought with him. So I think that's kind of important. I think into the whole story that they are two of the ones that that Paddy Hogan chose to bring with him. Um, so they went in, and Hogan went to one side of the bear. And Tom Nagel went to the other side of the bear and Hogan on seeing Sonny Jim shot at him. But the bullet just hit off a, off, off a Sonny Jim and by all accounts, he fired again and fired again and nothing happened. And as you know, Neve, from all the research you've done, uh, the ammunition was wet. The ammunition was bad. Um, and from that, uh, uh, Tom Nagel on hearing it at the other side of the bear, hearing the shots, bust through the other side of it and an almost point blank shot shot Besant in the head. Um, I suppose from there the four the four um, volunteers would have left very quickly um, up along through John Street over Agers Lane if anybody's familiar with Cashel and possibly through the convent which we know the nuns in Cashel were very very good at taking in um, yeah. volunteers Sister, and Sister Barbara was the Th that, that's right. Me. guns, didn't she? <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's yeah. right. Either that, or I lived all my life. I lived on the Dweller Road, and it was called the Abbey Road. I suppose there was not like the houses on it now. So they headed for they headed for Dweller, and on getting to the Dweller, they went for the, the the dump where they where they had the guns hidden. But on arriving there, they realised that the guns had been borrowed for I think some attack they were planning in care so I suppose through the night and the next day they made their way towards the new inn area and 
along the line they picked up the likes of Ned Grogan and I think Paddy Lockman if I'm if I'm if I'm right Neve. Yeah you are um and I think that's that on the night of the fifth then they would have billeted down in the different areas there. And uh, Paddy Hogan brought Paddy Kane with him, who Paddy Kane, I'm, a man that I'm absolutely fascinated with. Um, just quickly, two, two minutes on, on Paddy Kane. Paddy Kane would have joined the, the British Army at 16 years of age, and he would have fought against the rebels in Dublin in 1916. And I suppose um, when the execution started, I suppose the British got a feeling that these boys weren't up to the task of, 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 of doing that to their own Irishmen. So they were all sent back to Temple Moor. And it appears from his, from his records that his punishment for being caught drinking at Christmas 1916 was that he was sent to the front. He was sent off to... He was sent off to fight in Belgium. Um, he give he was he was taken prisoner in 1918 and give until 1919. Even though the armistice was we were is it November 11 to November or something 1918, but he was released in January of 1919. Made his way across Europe, back along and, and got back. And um, he was to go to Clamel to be demobbed. And family lore has it that that he didn't go to be demobbed. And one of the reasons was maybe that he wanted to keep his big army jacket he had or or, or, or or whatnot, you know. So on getting back to Cashel, he found out that all his friends were in, in, in the IRA. Um, Hogan had no, it was, there was no republicanism in their family or whatsoever. So he joined the IRA and, and kind of, I suppose, quickly came up through the ranks. I suppose his military history would have been used to good effect. Um, but on that night then out in Derry Clooney, which I, I visited a year or two ago, it's such a remote place. You would have to have, you just would never find it where, where Dags was. I think there's an American couple living there, small little, small little house. Um, and what happened there, the two, uh, Hogan and Kane went there, Ned Grogan and, and, and others went, went to the, I think, a house just up the road. Is that right, Neve? Yeah, they, they built, there were three houses along the road and the, the yeah. other lads was distributed themselves in the other two houses, yeah. But they were yeah. quite a way away. They were, they were okay. several hundred yards, yards away. Okay, yeah. so I think at seven o'clock in the morning there was a the, the military kind of surrounded this house and I suppose they knocked on the door and I think Mrs. Dagg maybe came to the door and I think when there wasn't a list up on the door of the occupants of the house, um, I think they, 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 they came in and I suppose on that you can read in Paddy Kane's um, statement in the military bureau that himself and, and uh, Paddy Hogan started to get, get dressed. And I think so, out the door so then did Hogan. Sorry, sorry, Mark. This is about seven yeah. o'clock in the morning. Seven o'clock in the morning. The night in Dags. And it's a military a military party from care have come That's to right. Derry Tooney out of nowhere. They've just yeah. marched to Derry Tooney to do searches. Yeah. Okay. So they're knocking on one, the door. One, one, they're knocking on the door and it's funny, but at seven o'clock this morning, um, I was up and I was just thinking, you know, getting an idea for how dark or bright it might be at, at this time of the year. Um, so I suppose it was just getting bright. And um, I suppose Hogan, once they realised what was going on, and um, by all accounts, Hogan fired out the door of the bedroom from that the military backed off. And I think that Hogan took one window and, and, and Paddy Kane took the other window. And I suppose in the shoot off, I suppose maybe the boys knew it was, it was inevitable that their, that their ammunition wasn't any good. Um, I, I can't think of the, the guy's name, the, the, the guy in, in, in the, the, the Crown Forces guy who got shot in the arm, but it, 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 didn't, it didn't do, Marshall, that's right, that's right. Um, but Hogan, Paddy Hogan, unfortunately got, got, got shot um, under the eye and you know, it's very sad to read the military, the, the military statement. You know, Neve standing at his grave today, I kind of, I know these are stories we read and from reading, mm -hmm. reading the, the accounts of, of, of Dan Breen and that, you know, I know we love reading it, but it, it's, it's, I actually stood at his grave today and I just said, how dreadful it must have been. The Luby brothers were only put down in the same grave a few months before it. By all accounts, at the Luby brothers, funeral and um, Paddy Hogan said to a man he said just plenty of room down there he said for more of us you know and he was down there himself a very very short time later and um, I suppose in town in Cashel the consequences of of the shoot of the shooting of Sonny Jim in there the military surrounded the town inside and um, 
by all accounts, Dean Innocent Ryan, very famous, infamous maybe character in the town. Um, by all accounts, he faced down the Black and Tans on, on the main street in Cashel. And older folk would have passed it down that he would have marched up and down the town all night in red regalia. He's he's frock or whatever you would call it. Um, and he marched up and down the town with a big bell, ringing a bell all night. And seemingly he faced down, um, I don't know, it might have been that Litchfield guy or Litchford that, that, that we were talking about earlier on. But whatever Innocent Ryan said to him, being Innocent Ryan, they backed off and they left town with his body. But in the shooting in Cantwell's, it's, it's important to remember that there was a girl, Josie Cantwell, who was also shot. Um, some accounts say that she was sitting on Besson's knee. Other accounts have it that she was behind the bear and she was hit by a ricocheted bullet. I suppose... Who knows? Um, but I can remember Padraig O'Mahuna, Padraig, who you would have known me from, from living in Cash and Padraig when he died two years ago. Um, Padraig, um, he would have told me that his mother would have said that she remembers the woman at the Cantwells was carried um, up the street in Cashel. She was brought to doctors and from there down to the railway station in Cashel, which is no longer there. And she was brought straight to Dublin. Now she survived, but Padraig O'Mahuna's mother told him and, and he told me that there was blood on the streets of Cashel for months after it, that people could, people were out scrubbing the blood trying to get it off of the off of the footpath. So I suppose there's just another little, you know, it, it brings the, the reality of, 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 of what's happening at this time. You know, um, again, then at, at, at Paddy Hogan's funeral, sorry, just to go back to at, at, at Dags, then Paddy Kane, obviously inside with no ammunition left, um, he surrendered and he was taken taken prisoner and he was brought out and the body of Paddy Hogan was thrown up onto the back of, of, of a horse and care um, and Paddy Kane was tied to the back of it. And he was marched in, and and I think you um you, we were we were discussing the other night, didn't weren't they stopped then by by the auxiliaries or were they stopped by Black and Tans who wanted yeah. to shoot? Yeah, so Paddy Kane's um witness statement says that they they were stopped by um party Black and Tans who were probably yeah. on their way into Cashel. Uh, they may have been the the very men that uh, were into to um conduct the reprisals for Sonny Jim. Um, yeah. And they demanded from the military that they take Paddy Kane and the marshal who was actually shot in the arm by Paddy Hogan inside and Dags, marshal refused to hand over um, their prisoner. And that pro that certainly saved uh, Paddy Kane's life. I think did, did, did Marshall comment to Paddy Hogan? He said your ammunition was bad or something. Did, yeah, he said was... Paddy Kane, yeah, your, yeah. your ammunition was bad. He knew. <laughs> Yeah, just a little story was passed down to me a few years ago by Willem Lees, and Willem is out lives out the Wallace side. And Willem would have told me that his grandmother passed it down to him that they used to, that this was a kind of a common problem with the ammunition getting wet, and they used to hide it under the bellows in the fire to keep the ammunition dry and things like that. So there's just a little a little story that was passed down to me um, like that. But I suppose then Paddy Hogan's Paddy Hogan's funeral. Um, there was no mourners allowed to 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 sympathise with the family. That was it. And I suppose uh, another big thing one of the one of the boys were talking earlier on about it is Hogan was the eldest uh, eldest child in his family. And I suppose the job of a draper's assistant would have been a very good job at the time. Um, and I suppose would have used the money to to support the family and help out. And 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 that must have been you know I think all day I, I visited his grave today and I just put flowers on from anybody who couldn't visit today. But again, standing in it, I was just thinking I was out there at about half five and I was saying, what were the family going through this time? You know, because it might have taken a few hours for news to filter through. And um, I think his father identified his body. Um, and when it was when it was handed back, you know, if, if, if you go through um, an overall read the military, the, the, the military bureau, but I think the pensions records are, 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 are so sad when you read through what his family went through trying to get money and I know did his father first take up the case and then his sister later took it up, you know, just try, and, and, and these people had to fight, you know, a very important woman in Cashel to mention then. I know you're, you're a massive uh, admirer of as well as Miss Anastasia and Evan, you know, she was the she was the head of coming a man in the town and and what a wonderful woman this woman really really should be 
should be remembered, you know, for everything that she done, you know. And I, I think a lot of the time the women kind of they go a lot very much under the radar. I know we we we'll speak about we we'll speak about Miss Nevin on another night, you know, but I think it's yeah. important to remember yeah. her as well, you know. Absolutely. Um the I think Paddy Hogan, you said Paddy Hogan and um Bill O'Donnell stayed in E. D. Ryan's the night before and the, and the night the before the other two stayed at station so, evans so the other two stayed at station evans which would have been paddy kane who we've spoke about and tom nagel who fired the shot who killed sonny jim mm -hmm. um i think interesting uh both both had been ex-soldiers so i often wonder what the conversations were i know from paddy kane's family they would tell me that paddy kane died in 1975 and is buried on the rock it's funny but all four men who have been were involved in the sunny gym shooting i visited all their graves in the last i'd say maybe six months or so and um, tom nagel is buried in bally in in the back of the stud farm there what's it on um oh bally sheen Bally Sheen, Bally Sheen, sorry. Um, and I think Paddy Lapman is buried out there as well. So you know, any, any, anybody who's never been there, it's wonderful to go out there and, and, and see Nagel's grave and Paddy Lapman's. It's a little plaque up on the wall, but um, I'm probably I'm probably going off with a bit of a tangent now. But I, I, I often wonder what Kane and, and, and Nagel would have discussed because I suppose at the time it wasn't very popular being an ex-British soldier, I suppose, in to the climate that they came home from the war and they probably expected to be welcomed home as heroes and and, and they certainly weren't, you know. Well, I suppose their um, their skills were put to very good use by the likes of uh, Paddy Hogan. Um, Absolutely. You know, so um, they certainly, uh, it, you know, there's a lot. They were very valuable people because they were they were able to train the other volunteers in the arts of war. Um, Mark, I could talk to you all night about this because you, it's our pet subject. Um, it is. But, it is. <laughs> <laughs> we will. We will um, draw the, the panel discussion to a close. We have um, a very special tribute um, as the last tribute of the night to all the volunteer families. Um, we've all managed to come together despite the lockdown uh, and share the night of history um, and song. And now we're just going to look at some faces from the War for Independence. Um, people sent us in their photos um, and then during the week, I was speaking to Padre Gokine from Rebel Hearts, and he very kindly got uh, Jamie Mochler, um to record um, a beautiful ballad to go with all these photos. Um, I think most of us know it. Um, it's very poignant. It is only our rivers run free. So bear with me while I um, I get it up. I'm, I'm not prepared. Um, so here we go. We'll see some some lovely faces. Um, from the past. Oh, and by the way, um, after this, we're going to stop the recording at the end of this, but afterwards we are, uh, we're having a little bit of an open house if you've still, uh, if you're still on for some more history. Um, so don't, uh, don't, don't leave um, unless you have to. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. 
Thank you, everybody, and good night. Yeah, he's a kind of artist that won't act out.